Sure. I just had to start recording. Um, yeah, normally our executive director, Maury, is here, but she's out of town. So I'm the director of stewardship and outreach. Um, I run the ADOPT program for the Watershed Association, Adopt Your Watershed. So we have lots of fiscal sponsors and especially lots of stewardship volunteers, um, also events and, and outreach. So yeah, I, I always enjoy attending these meetings and if not attending them, watching them after the fact. So happy to be here with y'all today. Shelly, you wanna do a little introduction? Hi, <clears throat> I'm Shelly Moeller, and um, my background is public health, and I am a contractor with the Santa Fe County, um, really serving as a, I would call it a conduit of communication and information for the community around the PFAS contamination that um, has been found stemming from the Army National Guard, and now there's couple of other projects that are looking to really characterize that contamination. And my role is <laughs> really bringing um, those government entities that are responsible for characterization and cleanup, um, opening up that communication to the community so the community knows what's going on, as well as just giving them information about PFAS in general, the health impacts, um, filtration, testing, water, that kind of thing. So that's me. Okay. Darren? Good morning. I'm Darren Munzberg. I'm the vice president of the La Bajada Community Ditch and Mutual Domestic Water Association down here at the, the uh, tail end of the Cañada de Santa Fe, uh, the lower Santa Fe River. Um, so I guess, yeah, Travis, uh, Mr. Travis, we got to figure out a way to get you down past Tres Rios too, and, and down to La Ojada, uh to see the last, um, you know, down to the Santa Fe County line uh, uh, that I'm looking at maybe the first week of October. Um, if you might pencil us in for that, uh, or we'll coordinate with Carl if, if uh, he's not doing anything sooner than that. So um, that would be trip. really you know, cool. I mean, it's one of those things we don't see up here because it's so... It's down in the valley, basically. It's in the La Bajada. And, and it's just the history of that. And I won't go into it right now, but it's a pretty amazing place. It really is. Thanks, Darren. Bobby? Yeah, um, I'm Bobby Basold. I'm with the <laughs> with a very tiny organization called Rivers Run Through Us. We walk the length of the Santa Fe River from the upper watershed to the Rio Grande. Um, we have a website. We have a little video about that. And um, I have continued to advocate for the Santa Fe River and for water. And um, I'm an artist and an activist. Thank so, you. Bobby, how long did that uh, walk take you? Five days and, and five nights. We spent the, and four nights? Four nights, five nights. Yeah, five days, four nights. And we spent the night along the way. We carried our stuff and we had people meet us and bring this and that and the other thing. So we didn't have to carry, you know, everything. So that was helpful. But anyway, it was, um, yeah. And we stayed with different people along the way. Um, Pretty amazing. It was fun. Um, and Mayor Me from um, Agua Fria. <laughs> yeah. So I'm president of our our Fria Village Association and our Sekia Association and uh, our Well Owners Association. But I guess only because no one else wants to do it. <laughs> you you state your, your contribution to the community, but you're right. I mean, there comes a point it would be nice to have someone step up and Say hey, I'd like to take over, but that hasn't happened so far. Well, I, I threatened them when I turned sixty-five. I said, you know, it's time to retire for me. But they didn't buy it. And, and Mr. Harden, would you introduce yourself? Can't hear you. Hello. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, everybody. Uh, yeah. Good morning. Uh, Andrew Harnden, uh, uh, county water planner, 
Uh, I work in the planning division. I've been here two months and uh, I've met most of you. I actually think all of you before already. Um, and I appreciate all the great intro and background and a lot of very good and exciting ideas out there. And I, I look forward to uh, working with you all in the in the months and uh, hopefully years to come. Sounds good. Travis, would you tell us a little about, about yourself? Well, uh, it's nice to meet you guys. My name is Travis Sutterquist. I uh, moved down to Santa Fe from Idaho uh, back in the middle of May. So born and raised in Idaho. I went to college in northern Idaho and got my degree in biological and agricultural engineering. Um, I moved down to southeastern Idaho, um, Idaho Falls to be specifically, and then I worked for um, the Idaho Department of Water Resources for about eight years. Then I thought, you know, I kind of want to go see a different area and uh, came to Santa Fe for a conference, kind of fell in love with the area and started looking for jobs. Moved down here and I was hired on as the water resources manager for Santa Fe County. And then uh, in a short amount of time, I got moved into the deputy director of utilities position. And uh, I started officially um, Monday. So uh, I've had quite the uh, the experience so far um, with uh, getting kind of thrown into uh, the deep end right away. Uh, I love uh, love the idea of the touring of these uh, surrounding areas. Um, so far, it seems like I've only been focused on exploring in Santa Fe or the immediate surrounding areas of Santa Fe. So I would like to get out and actually see uh, kind of what we've got surrounding us um, i've been doing all of the touristy stuff so i'm, I'm kind of uh looking to uh to expand out to hike bike maybe see some of these rivers to go fishing uh, all of that stuff um, but yeah so far i'm really enjoying the area nice nice to have you aboard um so this is an interesting time um because literally almost since we Put together the agenda things have changed a little bit uh, one of the surprises i think many of us know about is that uh, paul tillman has left the county um, before he left he um, reposted the rfp that we put together for the lower santa fe river watershed planning process um, now this was a result maury and i maury hensley and i met with Paul some weeks ago, and we discussed getting this uh, planning process back on track. Um, we, we didn't know that he would um, kind of independently decide to just repost what was previously posted for the um, consultant doing the lower planning for the lower San Fe River planning process. And I will give you a real quick history because not all of you know uh, that whole process. That um, process began when the city and county decided to embark on the idea of a return flow credit, a return flow pipeline for return flow credit so they could draw more water out of the Santa Fe out of the Rio Grande River. Um, and that set into motion a whole lot of things. One, it Immediately, we got together a group called the Pipeline Coalition. Um, and it, and I, I sent you that list, uh, Travis, it's 21 you know, organizations, associations, um, individuals, farmers, ranchers, <clears throat> who were all concerned about what would happen uh, when the re return flow pipeline was um, put into operation. And so the Pipeline Coalition responded uh, we got together and we actually participated um, in the process of uh, the agreement between the city and county for the pipeline. Um, and we also participated in the creation of the RFP. And I want to real quick to stop for a second and introduce Bill Schneider, who I work with at the city of Santa Fe. Bill, you want to do a little introduction? Oh, hello, everyone. I see a lot of familiar faces. Bill Schneider, Santa Fe Water. Um, take a lot of uh, uh, pride in being able to work with this great team and, and hope we can uh, make improvements on the lower Santa Fe River. So thank you for having me. Have you met Travis yet? I have. 
Okay, okay. And Andrew? No, I've not met Andrew. Okay, yeah. that's it, Andrew. Andrew, again, your title? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I, I, again, I'm the water planner in the planning division in the growth management department at Santa Fe County. Uh, I'm not sure where Mr. Tillman went. Um, it was anyway, I, yeah, he just, he was gone. Um, anyway, so before he left, um, and the, I guess, Bill, this is something I don't think you know, but uh, Maury and I kind of figured out what happened with that RFP. Uh, we, Maury and I had met with Tillman some weeks ago and uh, talked about getting the planning process back on track. And uh, apparently to him, that meant just reposting the, the uh, previous RFP. Um, and so that was a little bit, as I think we've all understood, there's a little bit of a surprise to us because we didn't know that he was going to do that. Uh, but it's fine. I mean, it's one of those things is I think we take this as an opportunity um, and a moment to maybe uh, kind of look at things. Hey, uh, Carl, um, yeah. real quick. Uh, so that RFP that you sent me, that was the one that was posted back in 2023 and was contracted with Kaleidoscope. And Correct. we didn't proceed to the end with Kaleidoscope. And so when Paul said that he was going to repost the RFP, we were actually working through the process of going and putting it out there and having other people propose for it. So we haven't posted it again for um, consultants to um, send their proposals. So there's okay. still an opportunity for us to uh, to look into a different direction for this RFP. Um, I'm not sure it needs to be a different direction. I thought about that a lot because, you know, things have changed. It was two years ago that we did the RFP. And before we go, Janet, can you introduce yourself? I'm a uh working on my my video here we go um i'm janet mcvicker i'm um on the santa fe watershed association board and have been for a really long time oh, wow. and i'm um i'm interested in being uh better informed about the traditional communities issues. I've been to a few of these meetings, but not enough to feel comfortable with what's okay. going on. So I look forward to hearing what's being said to today. Thank you. Welcome. Nice Thanks. to have you here. Um, Appreciate so it. Travis, yeah, I mean, the whole thing with, with Kaleidoscope <clears throat> was a disaster in all honesty. And it, okay, so the process, we get the RFP done, and it took nine months to go through procurement, the county procurement. And then we got a kaleidoscope and that for the next six or seven months, that was, wasn't thing, didn't work out very well. <clears throat> and then it kind of got lost in the shuffle, or at least it, from our perspective, we didn't know what was going on with the um, planning process. And I think at one point the, the um, city and county were negotiating negotiating the possibility of including it in a memo of understanding between the two um, and then that didn't pan out so now that we have this again this opportunity i think it's really important to take advantage of it um, certainly there are things in that that are different now um, but i think that those are things that we can sit down with the consultant and talk through um, but i i have to say hey, there's there's one thing two things I think would be helpful. One, we would like to um, be involved in helping select the consultant. Um, if that had happened last time, it might have made a little bit of a difference. Not that we're gonna make a decision, but we certainly would like to, to be represented and be able to contribute to that process. Um, and then once the consultant is hired, um, I would like to propose that we, um, recreate a subcommittee of some sort to um, work with the consultant to support their efforts. 
um, because again, we've got a lot of people with a lot of knowledge and interest in, in moving forward. So that's just a thought to think about. So that's where we are in terms of that planning process right now. So um, one of the things I wanted to do today, uh, because at, well, that was before we knew the planning process was back on, on board, was to talk about where we go as an organization. And I think we can do that still in terms of things that we want to accomplish and things we need to get done. Um, I mean, one of the things um, I think is important, we start to help maybe prioritize some of the objectives. And, you know, if you look back, and I wish I'd done this now, I, I apologize for not doing that, but if you look at the RFP, there were a number of things that we wanted to have happen that are actually in process. For example, one of the things we had requested is downstream water quality testing. And I was in touch with Amy Ewing yesterday and it's caught up in the New Mexico Environment Department um, bureaucratic process. And there has to be a hearing and then once the hearing's done then they can set up a plan. So that's not gonna start tomorrow morning, but hopefully within the next few weeks we will have a water quality testing below the wastewater treatment plant, I believe at five or six different locations, it'll be monthly testing for two years. And all of us, I think, agree that that's really important information to be able to document what's happening beyond the wastewater treatment plant. So that's one of the things. Uh, the wastewater treatment plant in and of itself is, is problematic. Um, and I, you know, for, I, I'm on the city side a little bit now. Well, I'm on both sides actually, so I'm playing both sides against the middle, maybe. Anyway, but um, from a city perspective, I can tell you, John is pulling every string he can to try and fix the damn plant, and it's just a mess. Um, and it's a mess because the big issue is the UV system not functioning properly, and until that happens, it's just it's, it's hit or miss about how well they can. Um, sanitize the water. Bottom line, I mean, and, and believe me, they're pouring money into it hand over fist to try and fix it. They have Hazen and Sawyer working very um, hard to kind of figure out how to, to fix this. And yeah, we all know that this is a plant that's 66 years old um, and it definitely was not maintained well. Um, and so that's what we're dealing with. And it's just gonna be a while before we get under control. But that's why this downstream water quality testing is so important, because we don't know how far down that E. coli and other contaminants are going. Are they all getting stuck in, in the artificial wetlands that was created by the um, um, Wild Earth Guardians? Uh, there's, there's something about Kravis. This is something that happened 25 years ago. So, um, and it was done, this, it's on city property. It was done with the city um, authorization to work with the Wild Earth Guardians. At that point, they were the um, Forest Guardians, right? Um, and that they put in, and it really did not have any community input. They put in a huge number of cottonwoods, willows, um, and created what we call an artificial wetland using the wastewater as their source of water. Um, and it has become problematic. Um, it has, we're concerned about the, both the quality of water in the wetlands, the, the soil contamination, we're concerned about that, concerned about whether it has affected local wells. Um, and all those things are things we want to, to kind of figure out and as we move forward to, to kind of, um, that's part of the riddle that we need to solve. Um, and how much is, yeah, Bobby, go ahead. So um, I, there's a couple of the other things in the RFP that, that need to be addressed, but in terms of the fire, the Wild Earth Guardians piece, having been there numerous times and walked along there, and, and as you know, beavers came back because there was suddenly, oh, food, yay. And, uh, and then there was some, there's been flooding incidents. So, um, and as ter in terms of the trees affecting the amount of water in the wells, cause a question for you, Carl, or anybody else, which is that the number of wells have increased hugely in the in that area, 
and that's more likely to affect the volume of water than the trees and the trees will act as filters as well as the beavers um so and as all, m most of you know i am an advocate for beavers and those trees because um the willows and the and the cottonwoods benefit the river um it just you know the, the fact that that wild earth guardians went ahead and did this without working with the community that's a major issue that still remains. So it's a learning piece, you know, that, and Wild Earth Guardians, I think had, has made an effort to work with, with folks and have attended meetings and things like that. So, so that's my well, little piece. D Darren? Okay, so uh, let's take it from there, from context and go fast forward to the last interaction. Unfortunately, there's nobody here today at the collaborative from the ex forest guardians, wild earth guardians to kind of um, keep track of that narrative. But from there to here, our latest interaction in terms of the traditional communities collaborative was we joined with them hand in hand in the pipeline collaborative to uh, start uh, uh, figuring out how we were going to manage and mitigate the impacts of the uh, proposed return flow credit pipeline. So that seems to have, um, it, that seems to be withering on the NEPA vine, um, but we're, we're, and remember that then Wild Earth Guardians turned around and made a, a, a their own settlement with the city outside of the, of the pipeline coalition and, and left, uh, all the rest of us kind of hanging while they went to the back room with the city. So there's there's that. But more importantly is right now, I'm wondering, Carl, I just want to clarify, the RFP that we're talking about, is this still the one for the stakeholder-driven uh, Lower Santa Fe River mitigation plan? Yes, it that is. We were putting to, okay, and this is what we were putting together in right. anticipation of the return flow credit pipeline. What I'm glad Bill's here. Bill was advising us that we were going to see and we could depend on a 50% reduction in flow in the lower Santa Fe River. Now, looking at the detrimental reliance of the traditional communities on that effluent, we've been seeking to try and get hopefully return flow credit through the natural course of the Santa Fe River back to its confluence with the Rio Grande. Absent that, um, I think I'm I'm pretty uh, uh, solid to say that that all the traditional communities are opposing that 50% reduction in flow, whatever causes it. If that that return flow pipeline is now shifted to back burner or off the table completely or being reconsidered as it should be in terms of its feasibility from that uh, 2017 reclamation study um, being and we're looking at either this constant resuscitation or life support of, of the uh, Paseo Real plant or the replacement of it, what I think we need to drive towards is formally changing the nature of this lower mitigation plan to, to broaden the scope so that it's not the next flavor that comes off the, the truck uh, next month when, when maybe return flow credit pipeline's gone, plant is still malfunctioning, or uh, there's some other idea that has a similar impact that allows us to keep this resource maybe more alive instead of committed just to that pipeline. I think we need to take that RFP if it's being reconsidered for reissuance. My first question is how much of the dough that we got for that was used up by, by Kaleidoscope? What's left there? And can we get this? I think this collaborative has the opportunity uh, to put this on the WPAC's work plan with the county commissioners and make sure that we are following up on this as saying, okay, what we're doing is we're pivoting. Um, we're not uh, throwing that out because we don't, we've lost track of what's happening with the return flow credit pipeline. What we're doing is recognizing a need for ongoing mitigation planning to be able to respond more resiliently to ongoing recurrent emergent threats to the lower Santa Fe River, to the riparian environment, Bobby, um, and especially to, uh, you know, the, the uh, two-leggeds that are, are members <laughs> of that uh, riparian environment. Um, uh, so, um, you know, and, and have been uh, 
in symbiosis with that river for centuries, if not uh, millennia already. So anyway, that, I'm going to start uh, going off on too much of a tangent, but we got to get a hold of this RFP and get a hold of this uh, lower river mitigation plan, keep it stakeholder driven and make it a little more uh, resilient, give ourselves a couple more paths to travel down to when one uh, path either is washed out or one actually gets blocked. You know? I think the way to do that is let's let's kind of make it formalized, something I can take back to WPAC and have it work through the, the work plan that's due for presentation to the BCC so that we can track it with the uh, county's results-based accountability system. And we can keep using county agencies and their common management system to, to move it forward. So we're not there being stakeholder driven and that turns into just chasing our tails um, without any conduit to get policy influenced through the BCC. So there, there's my suggestion. But how much dough is left? <laughs> well, well, we'll figure that out. That's a great kind of summation, I think, of where we want to go and what we want to do. Well spoken, Darren, really was. Um, again, I think we're at a moment um, of really wanting this city, county, stakeholder cooperation so that we can all be working together to, to further the protection and preservation of the watershed. Um, and it extends from the, uh, as, as um, from the peaks to the Rio, Erin English, uh, little, what she put together that presentation um, is such an important fact now. So it's not just the lower watershed, it should be the entire watershed. Um, and I think that's what you're saying, Darren, is we've got to have a broader view of this and a, a more uh, comprehensive and collaborative effort to, to make things happen. One of the things that stood out, I remember people talking about this, about the Pipeline Coalition. It was the first time the Asaki Association um, and Wild Earth Guardians were sitting at the same table and talking. Um, and it was good conversations. So there's no question about it. I mean, certainly we have our differences in terms of our approaches and, and ideas of, of how to move forward. But um, the more we talked, one of the things we always, um, everything was done by consensus. We never, you know, if we kept talking and talking until we had a consensus and something we can go. The process we used, we created a subcommittee of some pretty sharp people, a number of people in this group were involved in that, um, that met. And once we had a decision or did something, then we would take that back to the larger uh, membership of the Pipeline Coalition for their support and um, input and those kinds of things. And that process worked really well. Uh, I felt like when we uh, had finished the RFP that we had done something pretty, pretty important. And we have a new, um, addition to our group, and I want to introduce Alan Cook. Alan, would you introduce yourself? He works right down the hall from me. Uh, <laughs> hi, I'm Alan Hook, Water Resource Coordinator with the City of Santa Fe Water Division. And I'm also the and, program manager for the Upper Santa Fe Municipal Watershed. And that's the upper watershed behind him, which is really absolutely beautiful. I yeah. Alan took me on a tour a few weeks ago, and it was pretty... Pretty impressive to, to be up in that that area. So getting back, Darren, I think you've, you've hit the nail on the head. And I think the idea of the Water Policy Advisory Committee uh, being involved is something that would be really good. Because one of the responsibilities, and I, perhaps I'm not sure if you know this, um, the responsibility for overseeing this is the county. It was The city had given the county the responsibility, or the city and county had agreed that the county would oversee the planning process. And I guess that means budget, keeping things on track, um, making sure we're not going off uh, on the deep end, those kinds of things. So um, the WPAC may be the, the place to do that. Um, and certainly that's something I think would be worthy of some further discussion, but thank you for bringing that up, Darren. Um, any other comments right now? William, what yeah. are you up to? What are you thinking? No, Bobby, go ahead. Well, um, uh, importantly, Darren brought up the the uh, sewage treatment plant. 
with the ridiculous name that it has now. It is really a sewage treatment plant. This is our poop and our waste from the city of Santa Fe and to not deal with that is outrageous. And that has to be somehow worked into more bigger into the RFP. We did have it in there. Um, and then we also had um, uh, community involvement, uh, you know, to have various different groups that needed to be involved in this the pipeline thing. And um, the other part of that was potable water. And that is Carl, as you brought up, was the is the water testing that's going on now, which is really great. Thank you. Yeah. So, well, there's two things. One is, if you if, looking back in an RFP, there were two things we wanted. One is to look to see if there were improvements that could be done now to to get the plant at, back into operation. And we're at over eight million dollars they poured into the last few months in an effort to do that. Um, but again, the key is the UV system. Um, which is supposed to take three years. They're, they're hoping now they can do it within the next 12 months, have a whole new UV system. And once that goes into place, then I think we'll, we'll be able to manage the, the, the uh, sanitation issues. The other part of the RFP was looking at the future for a new plant. Um, and that is something that's on the table. Um, and I think you're right, William, the prices are, have gone up. Um, and I'm really not sure exactly. I've heard everything from 300 to, you know, and more for 300 million and more for a new plant. And so that's one of the things that is absolutely on the table. Um, one of the things that they're discussing is a small rate increase for um, city folks that would uh, provide for about $120 million over 30 years. Um, mm -hmm. And so those things are, John, John is, is looking everywhere he can to try and figure out where he can get money to be able to put in a new plant. But I think there is a, a honest and sincere intent of doing that. It's, it's the challenge of being, it's going to be able, it's going to be finding the money to do it. And so I think those are two things that Bobby, you brought up that were um, important parts of the, the RFP. So those things are kind of in process. Um, and again, I think you're right though, there needs to be more um, communication uh, and maybe involvement and, and knowledge about what's going on so we can keep um, keep abreast of exactly what, what um, challenges that the city is going through. Um, anyway, oh, I forgot to introduce myself, didn't I? <laughs> okay, real quick. So I'm currently... <laughs> I'm currently working as a project manager with the city of Santa Fe water um, department. And this is pretty funny, isn't it? So I'm, uh, uh, and I'm previous, previous president of the La Siena Valley Association. Um, I was the spokesperson for the pipeline coalition. I co-chair the Santa Fe River Traditional Communities Collaborative. And boy, do I have a lot of water in my background. Now you gotta understand, I grew up on the Rio Grande folks. So my house, our property, the four and a half acres uh, was on Rio Grande Boulevard in the North Valley of Albuquerque. At that, when I was little, it was North Valley and then it became the, the Village de los Ranchos in 1972. Um, and literally our, we had three acres of alfalfa. And sometime I'll show you the picture of my two brothers and I hauling, hey man, you would not believe the size of those bales. But anyway, so we had the alfalfa field then what we called the dirty ditch which was the irrigation arterial, big old ditch that watered our fields. And the next over that ne next kind of rise was a, what we called the clear ditch, which was the flood control that went down. Uh, I don't know what it did, but it was actually had fish in it. Uh, and then there was the Rio Grande River. So I spent a lot of time on that river. Mm -hmm. And one of the stories I always tell when I was about uh, 12, 13, my buddy Tim Downey and I, I'd gotten this little camping kit uh, kit for my birthday, which was in July, um, and we went out camping on, on the river, and I swear, this is the early 60s, and the river is about 20 inches wide. Um, it was during a drought period, but, and we got the absolute worst sunburns I've ever had in my entire life. Uh, anyway, so yeah, so there's a water, that's my little background, So in, and I'm very interested in figuring out what we can do to protect the watershed. In La Cienega, it's the springs. We've seen a, a, a drastic reduction in our spring flows. 
um, and those are impacted by so many different factors, including um, Travis, you'll love this. There are four wells that are in the uh, El Dorado area that are located in the um, Tsuki um, formation um, that affect the springs in La Cienega. So when those wells started to go down, when those wells start to go down, they affect the spring flow in, in uh, it's the Ancha Tsuki formation. Um, when those wells start to go down, they affect the springs in La Cienega. The other thing is the proliferation of commercial, not commercial, but residential wells in La Cienega. Um, this is what I'll term the lot split development, where people come in, uh, buy a lot, split it, and everybody puts in a well without any of the subdivision requirements for well or, or wastewater. And so I'm estimating that we've had an additional, over the last 20 years, over 400 homes that have come in the community. So each one of those and this is where the county is remiss in, in educating people because uh, people come into the community, they get, they've got a well, and they just think have, they have um, unlimited water. So they'll put in a large, you know, pretty large gardens, maybe a small farm, um, equestrian facilities, um, without the understanding of what, what uh, impact they're having on the aquifer in and of itself. Um, and I can ramble on for a long time. So let's 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 talk about some other things. So one of my thoughts today is we start looking at what we would see as priorities um, for the next steps of either the consultant in the planning process or for us to to take on. Um, and I think I listed them. Um, one of them is conservation and water harvesting. Um, I was at a conservation meeting uh, the city conservation meeting on Tuesday um, and it's amazing some of the things that they're doing um, and we need to replicate some of those things in the county um, but the, in terms of, of um, in terms excuse me oh cool thank you Andrew um, check the chat folks um, but anyway so um their conservation is led by Christine Chavez, um, and they've just done an amazing job in, in reducing the amount of water that the city uses. Um, and then Zoe Eikenson, who is with the uh, Parks and she's with Public Works, has is the River Commission, and they're doing a bunch of water harvesting, rain gardens kind of things. And it's just, it's one of those things that we just need to push out into the county and do similar things. Um, we need to retain as much water as we can. So that's one of the things about conservation and water harvesting. There's just simple things that we can do um, to make that happen. So that's one of the things uh, we can talk about. Stormwater management. This is interesting because they did talk about stormwater management, uh, the city, but it stops right at that county line. Uh, it doesn't go past that county line. And, and unfortunately, stormwater tends to go past the county line um, into, uh, we, what was six years ago? William, seven years ago when we had that flood, took out La Cienega or portions of our community. Yeah, um, it was, uh, uh, gosh, July 22nd, 2018. <laughs> this is amazing. Okay, I'm sure that's exactly right too. So, um, <laughs> all right. So that's that's six years ago that that um, and, and you that know happened. the thousand year flood, right? Everyone called it that. FEMA did a report on it to both city and county, and and nothing has uh, ever been acted on. Interesting. See, I have this this fantasy of where the uh, Arroyo Hondo comes into uh, across I-25, there's that huge area that's just vacant land right now. Um, that would be a perfect place to, to do something that would retain stormwater. And so that's one of the things, I've even mentioned that to Zoe, um, who got kind of excited about the idea. But again, it's gonna take county city, actually that's, that's city land now, isn't it? All of that on the that side of, of 599 is city. Yeah, so they need to, yeah, so we can talk about that, but it, it obviously impacts people in the county as well. So stormwater and aquifer recharge. 
um, spring restoration, which everybody thinks I'm nuts when I talk about how can we restore the springs, but I really think there's a uh, way that we can do that. Um, and Carl, that, that's the one that that is uh, calling that that for a preliminary engineering report that's that's open right now and actively going on um with the county so i i would i would have hoped that we would have seen more more people from lcva um here because they've been meeting frequently with county staff on getting this aquifer recharge um per done this is another one that is has been met it i don't think it's being perceived that way but when the conversations first began is perceived as one of these Trojan horse projects because it was looking at potentiality for extending county water service to some of those users you're talking about um, and getting them off of the wells if that potentiality existed. So, but I got to say, um, we are in a very different spot. I've been struck by Mr. Komen's very uh, commodified water attitude. I found it very off-putting. I, I think that that as that was pervading among community members at meetings, maybe that was the vibe we were getting. I don't think we're in that same position now. Mr. Sodaquist has to has to speak to that, but I'll be very frank in disclosing that. But that's part of the thing is we're here meeting as the traditional communities collaborative. And I think um, I, I need to recognize if it's not here, it should be here. There should be a very suspect, um, not cynical, but suspect approach to, to all of this uh, interactions with these larger entities. Our relationship with the city has, has continued to grow and improve over uh, the last decade, like significantly to where we can even start looking at, at influencing policy in the city and the county joint together as kind of one community, as opposed to this very fragmented, uh, you know, broken system that we're dealing with now, putting band-aids on and cobbling back together like uh, Rube Goldberg all the time, right? So, right. Um, but but that's an active uh, uh, RFP uh, that seeks uh, all, all the preliminary engineering for aquifer recharge systems. That led to my other question for Mr. Soderquist because there was a lot of talk about the Quill plant coming back online, the county's uh, wastewater treatment plant over by the penitentiary. And, um, you know, first thing out of Mr. Cummins' mouth was, well, then we're going to be able to start bulk sales of the treated water here and there. And again, completely ignoring other communities that that those tributaries, Bonanza, Alamo, uh, 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 feed into the uh, back into the La Cienega Valley, um, you know, the possibility of returning water to those courses that's being, uh, you know, appropriated or extracted from the ground. Any chance we can get to recharge either by uh, putting back into what are now ephemeral but used to be perennial streams or by increasing this water quality and doing more reclamation. It's good that they started trying to greenwash this all, but let's not forget that, that our traditional communities have become detrimentally reliant on this effluent that comes out of these plants. So it's uh, as much of an insult, you know, uh, we're not in a position to be too proud to take the effluent, right? It's as much of an insult to have it trucked off to go use for, for uh, some other uh, uh, watering the lawn or the, the golf course or whatever, as opposed to, no, we need to figure out how to make that quality that we can return it to the people who we have an obligation to, to keep that water flowing downstream. Just because growth upstream has been untrammeled and wanton and sprawling all over the place doesn't mean that the traditional communities have to bear that burden of having lower and lower quantity and lower and lower quality of their water over time. Uh, and I really just want to express that we've got to be watchful and vigilant against the commodification of this um, uh, uh, reclaimed water, this new resource that we may be very good at, at conserving and hopefully we get smarter at reclaiming. But we've got to be very vigilant in maintaining that, keeping it from just getting in the back of the truck to keep the dust down to build more of the unsustainable problem. Well spoken. Um, so, Travis, do you know what the status of the La Cienega Valley Association RFP is? Um, I'm not. I'm not sure exactly what the status is. Um, I 
still trying to catch up with all the RFPs that are active and then going <laughs> to become are. active. <laughs> uh, but, and I'm, I'm also just uh, trying to catch up with all the concerns of uh, all the constituents within the, the communities and um, what's happened yeah, in the past. Happened. I don't know if that's going to continue on, what's going to be the future. Yeah. I don't know. That's where I hope that we can help you. Uh, yeah. and take well, some of that I always like to shoulders and that we we would be able to do some of the work, the the grunt work in terms of, of helping figure things out. So we offer that as a, an opportunity for you to take some of those things off off your plate as we can. Um, but Darren brings up a good point. I mean, it's one of those things where we um, we've talked about this for a long time. And, and we're still not where we'd like to be by any measure. Um, and certainly one of the things that that um, was frustrating, and I'm going to talk about the Los Angeles Valley Association very quickly, um, was there are the La Cienega watershed conditions that were uh, put into place in 1996. Um, and one of those conditions was, was that every uh, new home had to have a meter put on their well and to report those findings um, on a yearly basis to the county. And I think it was um, last WPAC uh, meeting where um, Jacqueline Bean talked about, she gets maybe 10 or 11 reports a year out of all of those homes. And one of the things we realized is that requirement that the county had um, placed on these new homes was not being enforced. And so we um, wrote a letter to the county and said, what are you going to do about this? And at that point, the, the thought was to, um, it was Claudia Borchette was uh, the person in uh, Andrew's place, I think, at the time. Um, and she decided to, I can't remember uh, what, there was a plan, though. She had a plan to identify see if they could identify people who were obviously using too much water and talk to them. Well, she left and that went away and um, we're still kind of struggling with how to figure that. Oh, then we went to the to the well monitoring, um, monitoring the levels of the aquifer to see if that could give us some information about what was happening with the aquifer. And I'm not sure where that is right now. So that's one of those things that's kind of hanging out there that we would like to to bring up and, and revisit. And I think Jacqueline is the one that is, um, oversees that. I'm not positive, uh, but she was the, our contact in the, in the that, past. That just got switched from sustainability to, I think, uh, operations, if not, okay. to, if not to, uh, water utilities. Okay. And we've talked about the, the wastewater treatment plant, which is problematic, um, and now return flow credits for the Santa Fe River, this has gotten some renewed interest. And, and this is where um, it is complicated without question. Uh, we know for sure that water from the Santa Fe ri River reaches the Rio Grande River. That was documented in a, um, actually in a collaborative meeting by Paul, Dr. Paul Reinhardt with the New Mexico Tech and Stacey Tim Timmons with the Bureau of Geology and Mineral Resources who talked about that. So there is water that goes from the Santa Fe River into the Rio Grande, which would qualify for return flow credits. The question is, um, and maybe Bill, you can add to this, the uh, question is how quickly and how much. Is that pretty accurate, Bill? Yeah, I, I would say some of that water reaches the Rio Grande directly. A lot of it goes uh, back into groundwater and then daylights back into the river uh at a, at a variety of locations um i will say you know the city's position has always been is that utilizing the santa fe river as a conduit to obtain return flow credits is the preferred uh direction and location it's just a matter that the state has argued uh that the city would have to bear the losses of all the water uh that is not directly reaching the confluence with the rio so that's always been the challenge and, and hence the need so much, uh, to explore alternative means, engineered solutions in the case of the San Juan Chama return project. We have not given up hope. Uh, we do have a new state engineer um, and you know we, those conversations will continue to happen. Um, 
So that's all I can say on that. Okay, that's helpful for sure. I mean, it's, again, this is one of those things we want to pursue and and see if we can't. Um, and I'm I'm pretty sure, and they'll correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think they've ever done an actual study of that. Um, it because number one, it's really difficult to study. I think uh, both Paul, uh, Dr. Reinhardt, and and Stacy pointed that out. It's not a simple um, process to figure out that what water is reaching the Rio Grande, um, and it would require probably test wells in the Cochiti um, Pueblo land, Pueblo de Cochiti land. Um, and so those are all things that, that um, we can look toward and possibly address. Yeah. And, you know, Darren can speak to, to this as well. Uh, you know, so the challenge is there's contributions to the Santa Fe River from groundwater seeps and springs along many reaches. Uh, but we do have a, a highly demonstrable amount of you know water we can with con with confirmation that we we know reaches the La Bajada head gate we know reaches the USGS gauge. Brian Mann's master's thesis then illustrated that a lot of the water that did make it past those two um, metering locations does dissipate and infiltrate into groundwater along the floodplain on Cochiti. So that, that's been the challenge for us is, is tracing that water, quantifying it. Um, yeah, I mean, as you're aware, Kyle, Carl, the, the, the hydrogeology is so complex in there and having a dam right across the river certainly makes things more problematic and challenging. I agree. Uh, for those yeah. of you that don't know, Go ahead, Bobby. But Bill, how did the there's the, there's all those um, uh, Army Corps of Engineer uh, check dam things that are on Cochiti land. That how would does that also impact the? Yeah, it certainly interferes. It's spilling in the collection channel, and yeah, because the, the collection channel diverts it off from what would be the side, the bank aquifer of the Rio Grande and has it collected behind the dam in the reservoir. Um, there's still some subterranean flow into the bank aquifer of the Rio Grande right. as the slope of the La Majada Mesa and the Valle de Cochiti progress toward the river. But since that topography was changed by the dam, you see less, it splits. Part of it goes into the collection channel that goes there, and part of it still goes to some, some bosque and marsh um, there at the at the confluence below, below the dam. Uh, but, yeah, but the, access the, is... Yeah, I, I, it, I use the wrong term, not check dams. They're, they're flood control things that the Army Corps built. Um, and we had to walk up and around them. There's two. Um, but um, that's the spillway that leads back. If it goes up to design depth, then it then it's supposed to wash over and fill up all those natural arroyos and everything that I that are. I don't know that. I don't know that it's a spillway, Darren. It, it, yeah, but, but you know. Anyway, I, I, I mean, there's I we have photos of it. <laughs> some of them and anyway but the question really is is are though they're not useful they're not doing anything you know to me it was like a car an army corps of engineer project you know to you know for uh, that does nothing because there's no flooding in that area it's kind of crazy you're um, you're seeing that in terms of 30 years of extreme drought uh, that uh, I've seen all that, you know, all those arroyos in, in uh, flood state with uh, washing machines and pieces of cars and everything with the cows floating down them and all that in wow. uh, storm events in the 70s and 80s. You know? um, so the, I, I know some of what you're talking about are on some of the, like the old Santa Cruz Arroyo and that. There's also old, old Aseca infrastructure from La Oaxaca into that into that valley. Um, that still exists, the, the basalt stuff you see, but that's not, that That was old uh, Soil Conservation Service and Bureau of Reclamation works. Those weren't Corps of Engineers until late 60s. But uh, that stuff that, that shows up down there, those are, believe it or not, for, for when those arroyos swell. Um, and that, that flow starts coming back 
from say the, the Santa Fe river naturally goes from Southeast to Northwest. Right. And that flow from the spillways and those berms and uh, uh, I guess swales makes it flow back towards La Oaxaca, back to the uh, uh, Southeast against the natural course of the river. Should that flood event occur. It's interesting how that pool forms when it's supposed to go to design. Yeah, Bill had a, another call, so he's leaving us, but I think that's very, very helpful in terms of, of the challenges. There are a lot of them for sure. Um, so another thing, let's see. City, one of the things we, we mentioned in our RFP was the our, our interest in the city and county working more together. Um, and I think that's still kind of an unfulfilled um, opportunity. And I think that's something that we should we should talk about and, and see what we can do to encourage more of that to happen. Because as we all know, the water doesn't stop at the county city line. Um, and decisions made by the um, city impact the county folks. And so um, we can look at ways to improve those relationships uh, encourage better communication between the two bodies. Um, and so that's yeah. just. I had a comment, Carl, about that, going back sure. to William's comment about the 2018 flood, because, um, I mean, it, this comes on the idea of city county. Uh, oh. This goes to the MS4 permit. So that is a city county and Department of Transportation permit. So it's a collaborative permit under EPA. And so since since that flood, I mean, I don't need to defend Zoe Isaacson in public works, but they have, you know, the city's put $4 million worth of stormwater projects along the Santa Fe River, plus further work uh, on arroyos like Arroyo de los Chumisos with the Watershed Association to really slow down that stormwater flow um, and also improve, you know, the whole kind of riparian system along the river, along our arroyos, um, the river trail to really slow down those potential flood events for 500 plus years. I mean, normally we don't see those. Uh, that was a very rare event, but I think the amount of money that's actually gone into the, to the river itself as sort of a, uh, secondary improvement of the river trail system is pretty remarkable. And then even the storm event that shut down like West Alameda, right by Kaya Nopal there, that even Zoe was involved with in public works because instead of just making it another, you know, drainage into the river that was going to fill up with silt, they ended up creating sort of an infiltration, um, infiltration garden, I guess you would say, or infiltration area. So, so you're not just continually adding more sediment, but you're actually getting the water to slow down in that reach. And I think that's, you know, it has been remarkable uh, progress we're still continuing forward with the MS4 process and water quality improvements, but I wouldn't say nothing has happened since 18, for sure. I just want to put that out there. Believe me, Zoe is one of my, um, I think she's incredible. I think she does incredible work. I mean, I was at the, con uh, at the conservation meeting on Tuesday when she did a presentation. It's amazing what she's doing. It's like I want to steal her and use her out in the county as well <laughs> um, and have her help projects out in the county, not just through the city. So we'll see if we can borrow her knowledge and expertise at times. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. So and, and to your guys' point, it would definitely be great. You know, we all have every institution has turnover. It'd be great, great to continue that bridge into the county. Um, on all these projects and, you know, complete the system um, as it's been said from, you know, peaks to the Rio, um, especially when it comes to like these high flow flood events uh, through the system. I agree. You know, it's one of the things that if, if um, from my perspective, um, the staff tend to work okay together. It's when we get up into the council and commissioners counselors and commissioners where we get into a little bit of a a political th deal that's not not very productive or helpful um, that's just an observation uh, <clears throat> I think we we've, we've talked about the next agenda item is the WPAC um, and I think Darren's mentioned that a little bit but it's 
Um, yeah, why don't you talk about it now? What it's like in terms of, of the resources that are available to uh, the committee? Well, the best part, excuse me for just a second. The, the best part about it is, I guess, the access to staff. So there's, a, of course, it's water policy advisory. So there's that role in terms of, of making recommendations and reviews to the Board of County Commissioners. Since it's countywide, the, the, uh, it provides me, anyway, with a broader perspective on, on uh, uh, beyond just our local area on the lower Santa Fe River but that, that allows me to see some of the influences uh, um, on us and, and um, be aware of, of some of the factors we may need to mitigate against. Um, just a sec. Right now, practically, WPAC is in the process of putting together the work plan to be submitted to the BCC. And as I've been mentioning in the chat, uh, I guess a, a one active, uh, element of that is this uh, PER for the La Cienega and Cieneguilla uh, aquifer recharge options. Um, the uh, other is uh, uh, coming up are some of these other stormwater management programs. And those are split up, as I was just mentioning. Some of them have shifted over from sustainability, where a lot of them uh, are still being uh, shepherded, but have been, staff has split these duties up for stormwater management among, uh, and you know, the other uh, water management issues among the different uh, departments. So planning has some responsibilities. Uh, utilities obviously has their responsibilities. And they're all being tied together within one management system called results-based accountability, which I don't know if county staff is using. It sounds like the, the contractor grew that they, they had to get everybody functioning on the same page may have been contracted to the city as well. I think the the guru is there from Santa Fe. So um, anyway, it gives us a very uh, uh, formal framework in which to put, see these agenda items um, are kind of already in there and allows us to, to use staff uh, and assign uh, uh, duties and responsibilities to set to staff so that, that we can get information that we need. And then we can you know have informed opinions and get the subject matter expertise, or like you say, boots on the ground to get some of these things accomplished. So this is a uh, uh, kind of reformed and and is is uh, G. Carl. When was the first WPAC formed? Oh gosh, it's got to be over ten years ago. Okay, Either. and and that was part of the the original 2011 drought mitigation um, bigger resolution that that BCC came up with, right? And right. it's morphed since then into uh, a more representative body that's trying to get community input, um, like from our uh, area here, as well as from uh, domestic water users, uh, uh, other county users out in El Dorado, uh, Cañada de los Alamos, uh, throughout the county. So it's an interesting balancing act, and it's a good for me anyway to get the, um, the utilities director's perspectives on it. And so, yes, what we, what we have to keep in mind as, as traditional communities and longstanding users is that our, our community is growing so fast. Uh, and what we have to do is, is uh, steward this resource. So as we have the opportunity now to look towards all these different forms of reclamation and reuse, um, this is the time uh, to look at all of them kind of uh, uh, together from recharge to uh, re reuse, um, direct potable reuse. Um, as technology increases and things become more affordable, you know, that's uh, one part of the curve. But the other part is right now that we still have infrastructure funding and money that um, it's uh, who we need to get through to is BCC with their ICIP programs and uh, uh, looking at where we can get priorities for what our goals are in conservation and stewardship of the water resource um, actually funded and turned into action like recommendations on, OK, you're going to keep it. You know, unfortunately, it's the city's job to do what they're going to do with that particular plan. Ideally, we have a better relationship, as you're suggesting, between the city and county, where we're looking at the bigger community as a whole, as it relates to the water uniting us all, as opposed to the arbitrary lines of, of jurisdiction over it. So um, I, I see it as being a very pragmatic uh, tool, though, for ideas that come up in this coalition 
to be put into uh, uh, implementation through our, our uh, elected representatives, right? Through county staff. Well, well spoken. I wanted to give you a little bit of a history because I was on, I, I serve now as an ex officio member of the uh, WPAC, um, but I was an uh, official member up until about a, six months ago. <clears throat> and I tell you for the last, before this revamping of the WPAC, um, we would come up with ideas, but we had no way of getting anything into action. And so this is um, Commissioner Bustamante's push to make sure that the WPAC had the resources it needed to be able to actually do things. I mean, it's one of those things where we came up with these great ideas and we'd sit there and go, well, who's going to do it? And now we have that resource that the committee has that resource. So I think that's a very positive step in the right direction. All right, so the next thing is the stakeholder group. And this is something that it's not anything we need to solve today, but we have the Pipeline Coalition and we have the Santa Fe Rivers Traditional Communities Collaborative. Do we need two groups or should we combine them into one? And that's just kind of a, a topic for discussion. Uh, it seems to me that we're at a point now that, that um, maybe we don't call it the Pipeline Coalition anymore. Um, maybe we combine the two entities and, and try to work that way, but I'm, I'm open for suggestions and thoughts about that. I got that. I, um, so when the Pipeline Coalition began, that was to make it easier to meet more often because the collaborative only meets every other month. So that's yeah. not enough to create an RFP. Um, and that's still the case. I think that's still the case. That needs to be, um, you know. And and I th I thought of I thought of the uh, coalition as being an offshoot of the of the collaborative. I mean, for me, that's what it was. That's how I got engaged. Um, so well, I don't know how can that work, Carl. Well, it, the the pipeline coalition basically was a creation. The Aseki Association was involved. Uh, right. Sandy Watershed Association was involved. Right. Collaborative was, was involved. And then we brought brought in everybody else, opened the door and said, come on in, let's talk about water issues. And that's how that basically was created. Um, and it's not, again, it, it's it's an ad hoc group. It's not any, it doesn't have any formal um, bylaws and things like that. It was just right. a, an opportunity to meet and talk about water issues. Um, and the collaborative was kind of out there. And yeah, we used to meet monthly and then we went to bi-monthly and um, we're more a voice, um, an opportunity, a sounding board, an opportunity for people to talk about water issues. So um, is there a way to, to kind of meld the two or do we keep them separate? I don't know. I like the idea of changing the name because the emphasis is different, but but you know um but there does need to be a group that's willing to meet more often that's i mean those are, that's my thought and the the yeah that's a lot yeah Dan, what do you think well, i think that that uh maybe it is as simple as increasing the frequency of this collaborative's meeting and maybe we got to shake the bushes and get more of our uh, uh, traditional communities for whom this collaborative is named um, mm -hmm. to fill the little boxes over here in my, in my <laughs> Hollywood squares, right? Uh, so so uh, uh, maybe that's uh, what we need to do here is uh, keep this framework. The thing I'm going to uh, caution against is as we do that, there will be a natural uh, maybe test of, of affinities, right? Where uh, my first reaction is, like I say, I want I, I want to see more traditional users uh, um, in the group and expressing the uh, feelings, even if they're misconceptions that we need to help educate around, right? But uh, I, I don't want to see it taken over by by what I'm coming to call big green that people are calling big green for the sake of, you know what, those guys got effective lawyers, they're effective lit litigants. And and uh, that's 
we get so panicked that we look for political or litigious expediency like that, and we fall in with, with agendas that are not of our community, that are not um, uh, uh, based in the same traditional values that we have. So that's the only thing I would, I would caution against is that perhaps traditional communities is too exclusive for what we want to do. Uh, but I don't think so. So there's my, my take on it. How about you, William? Yeah, I don't think it's too exclusive. Um, and But what I would like to do is, you know, we had Matt Miller from uh, um, yeah. uh, Con well, Senator Ben Ray's office. We, uh, we had a bunch of other people uh, that were really, you know, policy players uh, that, you know, they've kind of dropped off of the the bi-monthly attendance so uh, if we could get them back maybe that's uh avenue that we should be pursuing um but then then it's nice to have the pipeline coalition where we don't have all of these policy makers there uh that we can discuss more frankly you know our, our needs so I mean, I kind of see that we still need the two of them. Okay. Um, but, you know, with different emphasis. Um, I think that makes sense. Yeah. But let, let's just kind of leave that for now. It'll be something we'll, we'll focus on at the next bi-monthly uh, collaborative meeting in two months. But yeah, I, I, I start to see... Uh, especially now that meeting more frequently might be a good thing to start doing. Um, and certainly um, if the Santa Fe Watershed Association will put up with us on a more frequent basis, we'll, we'll talk to Maury about that and, and Mara and see if that's possible. But yeah, I, I I understand that. It's one of those things in my head. I'm saying this, do we need these two groups? And, and you make good points, uh, both... Um, Darren and William make really good points, and I think that's that's. Um, but we'll, well we'll discuss it further and yeah. be clearer on our objectives. I know? I like more frequent meetings, but in maybe with a smaller groups. Uh, you know, I I want to see uh, Commissioner Bustamante, Commissioner Anna Hansen here. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I I think they were good. Uh, maybe a city councilor that's, um, you know, uh, water savvy, like um, uh, Carol Romero Worth, uh, because like Carol Romero Worth and Commissioner Anna Hamilton were actually, they had a couple of water meetings and then nothing happened. Uh, right. And I guess like people are saying, well, uh, WPAC came back. So they don't need to meet anymore, or but that's not really true either. Uh, really? You know, and, and I don't think you know they had the two meetings, and there wasn't a lot of uh, definition of where they were going with it. Uh, but certainly, city and county need to talk about water. Uh, it's not just that you bring out um, Jesse Roach every April, the last week of of uh april and he does what's up with water and that's all you ever need the the uh you know maybe that's all real estate agents need is reassurance that there's unlimited water supply but uh you know i i think we all need to be talking about water a lot more um and you know uh with credit uh due to the santa fe water association um, you know, I understand what Alan Hook is saying, but what I was doing is I made two presentations to both city council and county commission, and they were like oblivious to to the whole issue. Uh, you know, uh, I think what uh, the Santa Fe Water Shed Association is doing with Adopta Arroyo, I mean, that's a way to to really rein in those uh, thousand year floods. And, you know, climate scientists are telling us it's gonna be a lot more of them. Uh, Lanel did the report that 
um, the San Rodrigo Cristo will be uh, treeless by, was it 2047? I mean, that's, you know, just around the corner. Um, you know, what do we do if, if uh, uh, San Rodrigo Cristos are, are treeless? Uh, and, and basically it's, you know, those trees take 35 inches of water a year they'll get 25 and so therefore they just die. And then the snowpack that's under like these spruce trees, fir trees, um, you know, it can't last the winter. So there won't be a spring runoff. It'll just be a complete wow. um, evaporation. Yeah, I think one of the things you said I think is really important. Um, and that is is a presentation to both the county commission and the city council, mm -hmm. um, because there are new people there. They're not aware of us or what things that we're doing. Um, and I think that's something we should follow up on. We should really go before them and say, hey, this is who we are. This is what we're doing. Um, and we want to help with water issues for sure. So I think that's really a good idea. Yeah, you know, um... Anna Hansen had that joint meeting in 2017 and she had both entities there in the room. And that was the last meeting we had, um, you know, because I'm kind of tired of going to board of county commissioners and then to city council. And, you know, why can't they actually hear the same information at the same time and uh, be pressured into taking action? Okay. Well, maybe we can help them, help them along the way. <clears throat> Anything more on that, folks? Can I, can I add in? Um, part of the issue, William, is that the county listens with one ear, and the city listens from the other side. <laughs> Who's in the middle? <laughs> yeah, you yeah. got to figure out where you are <laughs> in the middle. Um, no, in all seriousness, though, I will say there is an opportunity to sort of weigh in on cities policy. So there's there's land use is reshaping, rewriting chapter 14. And there's a lot of information in there. Um, and, and I've brought this up internally. Uh, we're connected to chapter 14, obviously in development, you know, development requirements. Um, and Jesse is sort of building out this idea of uh, drought contingencies. In other words, right now our code on water use restrictions really goes from zero to 60. It's, you know, it has conservation already built into it, which I think is a success of Christine conservation office, even before Christine. Um, but then it goes straight to emergency measures where it's like no outdoor watering. Uh, it's very, um, very cut and dry. And so we're trying to work uh, especially Jesse on sort of this indicator, like seasonality, like if, you know, if we know it's a La Nina year, how do we get ahead of this? If we know we think we're going to have really high peak demand in the summer, how do we sort of ease into it with the public um, or even identify to the public that we actually have pretty robust water supplies from the winter? Um, and then also there's the fall, you know, things can change dramatically over a summer. Uh, whether you're in a drought period or you're coming out of it. Um, but that's not really linked very directly to land use. And I, and that's one of the things we've commented is if land use has very, um, very, uh, I guess, permitted strong um, requirements for new developments to have like street side trees and vegetation, but on the other side, we're saying, hey, we're in a drought and you got to re reduce your watering. That's not very compatible because, as you all know, those trees take two to three years to get established. So how do we communicate that for especially development to say maybe, you know, we need to hold off. You're still required to do that, but let's wait a year or two when we get out of this drought. Or how do we how do we adapt that to a, to a better policy of making the two connect? Um, cause we don't want to, you know, we don't want a, uh, a regional area of, of the city or even in the County where it's all rocks and, you know, Chamisa and, and, uh, you know, Choya cactus. Um, but at the same time, we got to balance out our resources to make, you know, some of the, 
uh, proposals like Tree City USA, creating shade, because shading actually helps on our conservation, but you need time to establish that. So it's something that all of you will have a chance to comment on soon. They're going to have you know public meetings rolling out sort of the first phase of how they reorganize Chapter 14. Um, and then the second phase is really taking all, all the public comments to say, okay, this part needs to change. So the first part is just reorg. Second phase will be making real comprehensive changes. But without your voices, um, again, the city doesn't know kind of how to, to adapt to that. So it's a real opportunity, I would say. And uh, um, thank you. Uh, you, uh, what about permeable, you know, surfaces? We, you know, the more we pave over, you know, the the city, the the greater is the heat sink. You know, we we're, we're in more trouble as you know, as there's more parking lots, there's more cars, there's more, you know. So dealing with those issues is hugely important but you know and certainly yes putting trees that's great um you know and and we should be putting you know putting an effort into putting trees at the south side of santa fe um to also help um you know with heat sinks but you know but if you're talking if you're going to talk about d development citywide you really need to address um paved surfaces and rooftops and all of that stuff. So if the roof is black, or, you know, the, you know, so. I think Alan brings up a really good point. And it's something I think we, we've observed with the county is the disconnect between um, the land use planning and water. It's like there's two different things going on and land use approves something and they don't connect it with the water. And it's it's just it's one of those things that we need to to figure out because it, it doesn't help us in terms of, of um, moving forward and doing things to to conserve water and protect water. Yeah, so, and then what happens is you know like we're pouring money on the on the back end trying to do conservation to slow down our peak days when we have really high water use, and so. Uh, I yeah, that is my point, Carl. Is like how do you how do you get it on the front end to be conscientious of it with land development code, which you know land use is more than happy, as you said, Bobby, to incorporate um, rainwater catchment systems. You know, uh, I think part of the the landscaping requirement is to to stop heat sink. Um, as for permeable payment, you know, I'm not that deep in the code to see if there's potentials of developers to do that. And at the same time, you know, the other side of the bookend is developers are trying to trying to do something as cheaply as possible. So how do we how do we make that balance uh in the process? So like um if we had like the master gardeners give us uh tree advice um because we've had uh like a good examples there on on Surios Road from airport to the interstate. Uh, they planted the purple robe uh, trees and they were wonderful for a couple of years. But when you plant so many trees of the same species, the bugs love it and they go from one to the other to kill them. And that's why there aren't any of the purple robe trees there. So if, if they staggered what trees were planted, they'd still have trees. The, the other thing is that you see so many subdivisions come in and in a couple of years, those trees are dead because no one's maintained the drip irrigation system. You know, I mean, you've got to always tinker with them. Um, my vice president, Charlie Gonzalez, who used to attend a lot, but he's, he's actually working as an inspector for the uh, uh, city of Santa Fe. Um, and he does stormwater uh, management uh, uh, inspections. And, you know, he was saying like at the Rufina Street apartments and it's not that old. I mean, maybe it's 20 years old, but uh, their, their catchment pond is no longer, you know, it's completely dry all year long. And so the inlets are kind of blocked and then they're flooding out to the other property owners. Um, and so 
part of the, the chapter 14 update should be a maintenance schedule for the developer. I mean, they put it in a certain way, but then it's going to fail eventually. And there's no incentive or rule or enforcement for them to, to really go back and look at that drainage pond. Yeah. Good well, Amara, Amara, would you address or talk about the um, program that's at Santa Fe High School, the the water gardens there? Um, sure. Yeah, that's a series of rain gardens or bioretention basins um, that was installed by Aaron Kaufman of Southwest Urban Hydrology. And it's actually been enacted in a few different park parking lots, too, where basically parking spaces are reclaimed to provide ecosystem services of slowing and sinking rainwater. I think there's 24 right now at the high school parking lot. Um, and yeah, we would love to see those everywhere. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. Thank you. So one of the things I would talk to, or, or looping back to what uh, William said, um, so we have been looking at other municipalities that have, um, you know, set up their irrigation systems. Because right now, we, you know, from the water utility perspective, you get an irrigation meter, anything over a thousand square feet, you have to have an irrigation meter. It doesn't define necessarily like what kind of vegetation are you, you know, watering with that irrigation meter. Um, it doesn't necessarily link with the water efficiency rating score, and that's something we're trying to improve with land use. But um, some of the other municipalities have done a good job of finding out from the developer, okay, so you set up your irrigation system. How many people did it take, to William's uh, point, how many people did it take to fix over your first two to three years? What was the cost of setting up that system? And then you actually have your cost estimates to roll into if that does, especially like street side or open spaces that a developer may start with and it gets transferred over to parks. Then you use, at least you have your cost estimates for the city to actually address that. And and there's also, I don't feel like right now, there's not a there's not a stick for the city to go to HOA and say, you know, hey, you got to keep up your trees. They've all died. We gave you an irrigation meter, you know, like, what have you been doing with the water? Did you have a break? Let us help you through our transmission and distribution staff. Um, so there's ways we could improve it, I think, by just knowing that, like, what it's what does it take from the O&M part of it? Because it reminds me of, like, I'm sure many of you have experienced this where, let's say you get a grant and you're ready to build something or or restore something. But you actually don't have the O and M to keep it up, <laughs> and then it just people are like, "What happened to that teen center or something?" You're like, well, we we didn't budget for what it actually takes to run or or keep it uh, or the you know increases with inflation or other adjustments that need to be made. So uh, again, it's another small detail, but it's an important one to, to understand our actual costs and maybe get that directly from the development itself. Amara. I wanna actually tie that a little bit to the rain garden conversation too. Maury has been sitting on uh, one of the committees in this rework of the land use code. And the beauty of rain gardens is that they capture rain. And so whatever trees or bushes or things are planted in those, don't not need irrigation if it's particularly dry and they're getting established, but whatever rain we get waters them um, and slows and sinks water and are generally planted with things that once they're established are pretty drought hardy. Um, so that could help balance out some of the expense and the maintenance required um, over the long term. Mar, do we have any, um, I know this is probably a difficult question to answer, uh, any cost estimates for a rain garden? Any general things? That, I'm sure it depends on the location and all that kind of stuff. Um, but that's one of the things I think, if you look at uh, seeking funding, 
Um, I think we should seek more funding for rain, rain gardens, um, and certainly both in, in the city and in the county. I think there are places certainly that we could do it in the county as well. Um, but uh, do you have any sense of what, what they cost? Maury would have a better, more accurate okay. um, response to that because she managed the grant that covered the biggest, most recent rain garden that we put in with Reese Baker. Um, but I think small, like the small pocket rain gardens are, this is a guesstimate, but you know, 25, 30,000 tops, depending on where and how easy the curb cuts are and, you know, like right. land reconstruction, but yeah. On the county, we don't need to worry about curb cuts very often. So <laughs> we could do things a little bit differently. And actually, we have a resource, uh, a young uh, gentleman who went through the program with the uh, watershed group in Tucson uh, and got a certificate, and he's very interested. And so I keep thinking if we can, his name is John Romans, and if we could pull him in, um, he's the kind that wants to show other people how to do that. And... Um, and so um, his idea is just to keep teaching people how to do their own, in a sense. And, and so anyway, those are things that I think that in terms of our conservation and water harvesting, those are things that we really need to kind of talk about more seriously. Carl, Carl could there be a meeting with, say, that guy or with the Santa Bay Watershed with Maury and Amara to work on starting to educate um, folks, you know, in person at the uh, La Cienega Community Center where we used to meet? Uh, sure, we could do that. Um, we can figure out something like that, absolutely. We can start talking. And I think that, you know, if you start looking about the RFP that the uh, La Cienega Valley Association is putting together, I think that may be a component. I, I'm all sure it will be a component of that, and that would be an opportunity to bring things together as well. Good idea, Bobby. Um, so the last agenda item is just kind of an announcement. And, and those of you that know, know Trace Rios Ranch um, and Travis, that will be a stop on our tour. Uh, it's a 298 acre ranch at the end of the La Cienega Valley. It's where the Santa Fe River, Bonanza Creek and Arroyo Hondo slash La Cienega Creek come together. Um, it uh, was previously owned by the Gallegos family, sold about 15 years ago. Um, uh, um, I'm not sure when the tour will be, Alan, um, but it was purchased about 15 years ago by a gentleman named Bob Cochran and sold actually uh, Alonzo um, Gallegos, who counted, there were 18 heirs, and so they had to sell it, basically. And so he sold it to Bob Cochran, but maintained his position with the ranch, was the foreman, managed the place. And now he and uh, about four or five of us are working on a plan to, to reacquire the land and make it into an educational resource, um, archaeological, environmental agricultural resource for the community. Um, and we're starting to get some ground and, and starting to see if we can't really pull this off. Um, one of the things he's going to do is, is work on the transfer of development rights as a way to fund it. And when we do those transfer of development rights, we're, we're going to look for someone who's willing to buy those. Um, and I know this is pie in the sky stuff. But I find someone who's willing to buy those development rights and retire them. Uh, we really don't want to promote more um, development in Santa Fe. We just want to be able to, to protect this really special place. I believe there's over 4,000 petroglyphs. Uh, there's an old mine. Um, Alonzo's starting to put in some trails. There's a studio there that we are going to convert into a meeting space. Um, the house is for rent. The house was damaged in the Pueblo Revolt is available to rent. Um, and so it, it's, it's we're active and, and we're moving forward and we know there are a whole lot of challenges ahead, big ones, money-wise, uh, but it's something we're all committed to, to playing out and see if we can't make this truly a community resource. And one of the things that's really neat, just recently, we now have 
um, the county who has the adjoining 400 acre Lava Hava Ranch um, have basically agreed to join with us to do something planning for both properties at the same time. And so we will keep you posted, but I just want to make that announcement. Okay, folks, anything else today? Any questions, comments? You got one, Andrew? Yeah, so uh, when, when is the tour? <laughs> I haven't set it up, but I will make sure you're invited. How's that? All right. And I think okay. so my co coworkers are quite involved with the Trace Rios, as you would know. And Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So. Okay. I'll let you know. All right, folks. As I always say, this is go ahead, Amara. Make a quick announcement. We are on the heels of one of our really big annual events, which is called Watershed Fest. Um, there's actually a number of different events in the upcoming um, week, starting Friday. The first one is a legacy walk and talk about the really uh, roots of our organization, and it'll be led uh, by Paige Grant, who founded the organization. And I believe we're going to get to hear from the esteemed William Mee on that talk, um, that'll be at San Isidro Park, which is really kind of ground zero for what inspired Paige to get all of this off the ground. Um, the next day we're doing a big uh, event at the library. There's gonna be an elm thinning workshop and an Arroyo cleanup and a recycled art party and a very cool sim table of our watershed um, where we can demonstrate lots of different scenarios. Um, Monday the 23rd, we have a film night at CCA, and then we have a, a wetlands um, tour at Los Glondrinas, Leonora Curtin, on the morning of the 26th, and then we're closing out with a happy hour at Tumble Root. Everything's free or by donation, um, and hope to <laughs> see you all there. It's all on our website, um, but just wanted to share with you all. You know, this is where I get really impressed very much with what the Santa Fe Watershed Association is doing. So thank you. This is this is good yes. stuff. You guys do good work. All right, folks, as I always say, this is my favorite group to get together with. Um, it's been a pleasure. It's been interesting. I think we've gotten some um, progress and some thoughts out there. So Keep up the water work. Uh, Janet, thank you for joining us today. Um, I hope you enjoyed the conversations. We, we're pretty uh, pretty good folks. Anyway, thank you all. See you soon. I just bye wanted bye. to say a quick thing um, that thank you uh, for including me. And I feel like I can participate in maybe the next meeting. I just sort of absorbing where you're at at this point and sounds I have some great. comments I could make in the future. That sounds okay. great. Thank you very Thanks. much. Andrew, thank you. Travis, thank you. Bye. I look forward to working with you guys. Catch you later, guys. Thank Bye. you. Have a good one. All right. Bye-bye.